Okay. All right. So now we will dive into our uh, random set of features that we would like to expose to everyone and hopefully get people to use them more often. Um, so in general, what is an ontology, I2B2 ontology good for? So I think traditionally we've always been making ontologies that were basically concept dictionaries. The list of concepts that uh, a researcher would need to use to build their cohort query. Um, but I, lately in an act, um, and in, I work on another little project, but um, we've been trying to branch out into the perspective of our ontology. So of course we have the classification ontologies, which are like the med by VA class type ontology, but you can also build uh, ontologies that are small, you know, embedded phenotypes, um, like the fee codes one, which is a really tiny kind of uh, example of that. Um, We'd also like for you to look at uh, building ontologies that may be like a disease modeling ontology, kind of like the COVID ontology in an act, where we've kind of gathered up all the concepts that are related to a given disease and organize it in a way that makes it convenient for a uh, investigator to explore that particular disease. Um, and then we also use them for standardization and harmonization. So, in, from that perspective, like we use in the NAC Shrine ontology, um, those are examples of those. So, you know, the standardization and the harmonization of concepts makes it easy for things like our sheriff plugin to be able to share uh, phenotypes and uh, concept sets uh, because we are all kind of standardized on these different, these I2V2 ontologies. Um, like I said, the COVID ontology, it has, you know, how do you define the disease? What are some of the, you know, how do you rank the severity? And so that's a really different organization of concepts. And the good thing about some of these types of ontologies is they're often using concepts that are already in your I2B2 fact table, but just giving the investigator a different perspective, a different way to query those concepts. Um, and then, like I said, the fee codes. Um, the second thing we wanted to kind of expose is like, how do we as a community start uh, collecting and exposing ontologies that you or me have created? Um, we have a lot of people using the Enact ontology and you know, I package up these files and um, you know, it's, it's a mess, but anyway. Um, but there's also ontologies available in BioPortal with a set of scripts that are available from the I2B2 team to translate them into I2B2 format. The other thing you can consider is a lot of sites are creating interesting um, uh, ontologies, like Griffin did contribute the uh, zip code ontology to the Enact ontology. Um, Mark Abadjian and the USC team has created that a great CEDO, um, which is uh, social determinants of health and environments ontologies. Um, GPC has a series of ontologies that can be shared. One, you know, like they said yesterday, they have uh, ACT ontology over PCORI, and they also have provided a notes metadata ontology that we're probably going to use in the ENACT um, network. So uh, we need a way to kind of uh, collect those and, and, and make it easy for uh, sites to take advantage of it so everybody's not reinventing the wheel. So um, you can join our work group and we can work on a solution for that. Like I said, we do have um, the ontology store, which we're hoping that will be a way to socialize and, and catalog and make it easy to share ontologies. Um, Kevin worked on this uh, right now, it just has the version 4.0 Enact Ontology as a whole ontology and as individual parts, but I'll add the 4.1 and hopefully some other ontologies. Um, I think a pain point for commu the community is the installation of ontology, so this was one of our solutions. Um, if other people have other solutions to make it easier for people to install ontologies, because I know people hate installing them, um, there's also uh, the set of ant scripts that the I2B2 team um, uh, uses to install ontology. So 
um, that may be a way to provide other ontologies, not just the the two uh, the demo and the uh, enact ontology. Maybe there is a way that we can use that tool as well to uh, make it easier for people to install ontologies. So the other uh, thing we wanted to expose, which uh, a couple people have talked about it already, is the multi-fact table. So this is a really powerful feature um, that I know at our site we just started using heavily instead of the single fact table. Um, you can do a partial or a full implementation of this and it's pretty easy to implement. Um, it really helps to improve the performance of uh, the use of I2B2. It's a great way to organize uh, different types of data, data that's of different provenance. You may put like uh, all of your NLP concepts in one um, fact table, whereas you keep all your EHR data in another fact table. It's used to um, for the OMOP in, uh, implementation of I2B2. Um, you can separate things by domain, as Mayo has done. Uh, you can keep your derived facts in a separate table. Um, you can separate things by the access frequency, because that'll improve the performance, because now you're not calling through all those facts just to get to one thing. And at our site, we're also using it to separate our like genomics data um, into different than our EHR data. Um, to implement the multi-fact table ontology, it's pretty simple. Um, basically, you just turn on a uh, feature uh, parameter in the hive to true. Uh, Got to take my glasses off for the name of it. Query process multi-fact table. You just set that to true, and then they have a very creative way that triggers the. Uh, query generation tool to look in these different fact tables. And basically what you're doing is you're just prefixing the um, C fact table column with the name of the table or view that the data is in. And that when the query gets generated, it will create a different kind of query that will um, go to your different fact tables before it um, makes the query. So you'll see a whole bunch of uh, query statements in your QT query master. So I would highly recommend that. The other feature that is my favorite feature is the breakdown queries. Um, they're really powerful. Um, this here is an example of how we're gonna be using it in the ENAC network. Uh, so what they allow you to do is like either stratify data differently on a cohort that you've selected. You can do cohort categorization, characterization, and you can create different types of reports. Um, so we've used it, we've created a, a NIH enrollment ontology that basically has the triples that, uh, you know, race, ethnicity, and gender. And so I can do a, uh, breakdown of that, and this is an example of something Kevin built for us that are going to be on our website. We'll have a series of formatters. So using Shrine, because now Shrine is allowing breakdowns to go from I2B2 to, to Shrine, which wasn't really possible before, but in the new Shrine it is, which is a great thing, it has a standard format. So you will have, you know, in the first column, we will have your ontology string, and then, you know, across uh, the rows, across the columns, it will have the different sites. And so what we're going to be doing is uh, people will be able to run that NIH, NIH enrollment form and export from Shrine the CSV, and then you can drag and drop that uh, CSV into a formatter. So we'll be making a series of those to be able to make um, table ones, different quality checks, and uh, like I said, the NIH enrollment, the couple of different formats of that. So this will be able to bring a lot of power to your investigators, to their desktops, so that um, they'll be able to do more than just get an individual query count or a, a demographic breakdown. So, um, and these, again, are examples. So we have, in an act, we've created Alex Hauser, um, Charlson, 
Uh, we've done top medications by ingredient, top diagnosis rolled up to a three-digit um, ICD. And these are just examples of, in the old I2B2, what they look like. Um, but this will allow us to create a lot of different types of um, reports for our users. Um, and breakdowns are also very easy to implement. And there's, like I said, they're super powerful because there's two different formats. You can either do a uh, path-based breakdown, and that's when you're basically using the ontology to define what the categories in your breakdown will be. So in, in a path-based breakdown, you put the, so you put sex or race, and what it'll do is it'll run queries on the first level below that path to, um, to give you the different uh, breakdown categories. So in sex, it'll have male, female. In race, it'll have you know black, white, Indian, that kind of thing. But even more powerful is you can put SQL, uh, you could create SQL-based breakdowns. And so you can imagine you can um, create stored procedures or whatever to do a more complex breakdown. So for like the medication breakdown, uh, the old medication breakdown would do, you know, I don't know how to explain it. Uh, you would end up like with 10 different version of acetaminophen as the top medications. But by doing this SQL based breakdown, I'm able to roll up to um, the ingredient level. So then you'll be able to see a more, a better variation of what the top medication ingredients are. So you won't just end up with all the same thing. Um, so I do that with the diagnosis and the um, uh, medication. The other thing is, you know, so like I said, like this one with the COVID, we have a series of labs that we created as part of that ontology, which were common labs that are run on uh, patients that had COVID. By using that path, I'm able to do a breakdown to, you know, see for your cohort, like, you know, have any of your patients had these types of labs? So, um, and so to, in order to implement it, you do QT breakdown path, and then you also do the QT result types. So right now there are two different types of um, query result generators to be able to execute those, the SQL one and then the path-based one. Um, so the next feature, which probably doesn't get as much use as it probably could, um, is using computed CDEM codes. The only issue I have with that one is that you don't, you. It's just for a single concept. You don't get to have the um, added ability of including a path with it so that it'll get all the things and then get all the sub, all the children and be able to use that as well. Um, but it's good for computing things. We use it for computing ages, length of stay, visit types. I do a little um, thing in the Enact ontology on data completeness. So basically just seeing, you know, uh, does the patient have at least one med? Do they have at least one lab? Or um, do they have data in this past year or the year before or the year before that? So that you can get a feel for like, what's the coverage of the data facts uh, for a given patient? Um, oh, my last thing was modifiers, but I think Griffin talked about it. I think this one is in the flux. It's, it has power. We did take them out of the Enact ontology just because it was kind of hard to harmonize. Um, so hopefully in the future, there's a, we find a better way to represent modifiers, but it does allow you to add dimension to a given query. Uh, so that's pretty much it for me. Again, we meet every third Thursday at noon. Um, the things we'll be talking about in the near future are pulling together some materials for beginners. Um, we also try to uh, tackle new ontology ideas um, or trying to improve existing ontologies uh, like the lab ontology and the med ontology, which are still a little bit of a struggle. And um, if you want to join us, you can help be part of that conversation. And we're also looking for people to beta test the ontology store. So that's it. Great. Thanks, Michelle.
Um, do you want to just stay up there to handle a couple questions, perhaps? Yes, so, if you don't mind, I'll join you up there. Um, there is a microphone there in the middle of the room. If anybody in the room has questions, we do have one from online that I'll go to if nobody has anything that they want to ask here. But I'll pause for a second. So um, this is a question from Mark that also reflects something that happened in the chat too. A little bit more information then about the uh, ontology store. Can you say a little bit more about how that's accessed? Uh, uh, so right now it's a GitHub. Actually, I meant to put in all the, but you know I got tired because I'm always doing my slides at the last minute. But uh, so I will, uh, in the slides when they get posted, I will put all the links to all the different ontologies that I'm aware of. But the ontology store is a GitHub. So it, and it has the installation instructions in that. Okay, mm -hmm. great, thanks. Uh, so when you're upgrading your, your ontology or changing it, is there, should I be like um, backing up all my data somehow? Or is there like zero chance that I'm gonna break that by changing ontologies in an irreversible way or? So when you ch when you change your ontology, you it doesn't affect your data. Okay. It shouldn't affect your data. I mean, I know the way that I've been doing it for the Enact ontology, I create a totally different table name. So the only table that really needs backed up when you're two tables that need backed up when you're doing an upgrade is the table access. Um, so I'm adding rows to that, but. I'm also turning off existing rows, but the, the actual table should be fine. Um, and then the concept dimension table is the table that is at greatest risk because that needs to kind of be modified almost mm -hmm. whole hog, I would say, just because there's just a lot of overlap and you want to make sure that you're not um, creating duplicates and other messy situations. But other than that, you should be fine. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. It's more of a comment. Go for it. Ontologies are I2B2's single greatest achievement in many ways, right? In that uh, it's its greatest strength in that we can represent all kinds of what otherwise might be, you know, really uh, uh, completely unstructured, you know, tables from who knows where and so forth, uh, which are really important if they're part of, you know, clinical studies, and, and but, you know, nobody really put them into a controlled vocabulary, but you can actually put those in I2B2 and then they can be used um, by folks who do not have expertise, right, in um, star schemas and all that kind of stuff and ontologies, frankly. Um, they're also really scary. And for exactly the reason that Zach just said, if you make one little slip up, everything suddenly breaks and you can't do anything, right? And so this, uh, this is a really tough thing to grapple with, I think, in, in, in I2B2 in that, and you know, the obvious kind of alternative was, well, forget ontologies, just put the codes in the table and use those, and that's what OMOP did. Right. And I would say that's why it's more popular than I2B2, because it's, it's straightforward. So you got the code right there. You don't have this, you know, yeah. oh, you know, you got to go look in this other table that if it's wrong, you know, okay. But focusing, perhaps, on how do we make this more tenable in the new world with large language models? that can go in and like look at these kinds of things. And one might think that that is a silly idea, but you know, try it, right? You know, okay. And, and Jeff, I don't see him today. Where is he? All right. Jeff Klan did that, right? I mean, he did, he went in, he works with Michelle every, day pretty much but anyway and you know it was like okay what what can we do and it was amazing what it can do right it can like you can tell it like get the documentation out of i2b2 and make it into a prompt 
and say, okay, make it look like you got something, make it look like this. Or you can say, hey, here's something, it should be looking like this, why doesn't it look like this? And stuff like that. And it will actually give you a tractable answer that will either fix your ontology or tell you what's wrong with your ontology or make you a new ontology you know, based on you know, just an arbitrary table of stuff. Um, or the great thing about like BioPortal is that it has all these ontologies in it. So why don't we get all our ontologies out of BioPortal? Well, I'll tell you why. They make little changes here and there and it breaks our scripts. And suddenly, you know, you've got a week-long project <laughs> trying to figure out why your script that used to import BioPortal ontologies isn't working anymore. Again, right, the, the, the flexibility of a large language model lets you kind of make it so that they're more adaptable, right? And if some, one little thing changes, they actually adapt and carry on, right? So I'm just, you know, this, the, this, um, this uh, weakness of I2B2, which is, you know, that it's so reliant on, on, on ontologies that, you know, um, it can make it kind of uh, challenging for the faint of heart. Um, uh, thank God Michelle's not faint of heart. Not faint of heart. Um, <laughs> you know, might be able to be overcome and, and, and take advantage of the fact that the ability to host data in something like a star schema, where uh, whether it's one fact table or multi-fact tables, in a star schema is the most flexible and from a computational point of view, the most optimized way to search for many billions or even hundreds of billions of, of rows of, of data. Oh, here's Jeff, who I just was talking about. I was listening to you. Okay. <laughs> All right, that was my piece. Is that on? Yeah, but I think that's on. Morning. I just wanted to make sure I uh, hit the mic. <laughs> um, I was thinking about this kind of as a question, but uh, Sean fits with what you were talking about in terms of sort of stretching the definition and thinking about how far we can push this idea. Ontology. I mean, I'm a huge fan of what what I2B2 has in its ontology, and I think there are lots of strengths. Like, for example, all the relationships that we can enforce using that ontology, right? Something's a child of something. So if you have two drugs, one of them is deprecated, I don't know, came from OMAP vocabularies, and another one, Rx norm caught up and now made a new concept. If you make one the child of another, it's a lot more usable, right? You roll up a bunch of clinical labs that mean the same thing. Lots and lots of examples where it's really, really powerful and helps us. But what I wanted to kind of pose as a question is, and also in compliance with one of the latest buzzwords, multimodal. People love multimodal. What about use cases where enumerating all the concepts that the users might need as building blocks for a query is hard? Genomics. Right. Can't enumerate every mutation out there and, you know, they're finding more and more. They're like zooming out and things appear to be coming up and flipping directions and going down and it's, you know, it's, it's never going to end. Is there some other way of searching these data domains and making them accessible to these cohort identification tools that is not reliant on a predefined ontology? Right. So I think uh, Nick, at least like for the genomic example, is uh, working on doing query XML, which will kind of be able to take advantage of um, not going directly at something. You know, you might have one concept that says, you know, I want to find this genomic variant, but you could design a query XML um, panel that would allow you to go at that other than in this hierarchical, predefined, ontological way. Um, so I think, 
that's going to be possible? I mean, Nick, hey, he wants the mic. Uh, yeah, so one of the uh, things that we've done in the latest update uh, for the new web client is we've gone ahead and abstracted out the uh, value, we call it by value uh, picker. So whenever you drag something over, it gives you the ability to create your own kind of data type that will go at uh, the XML, go at the... Um, uh, the modifier text or uh, the information that's actually in that record um, and you can create your own user interface for that. So it gives you the ability to create your own data types uh, that go within that. So right now the default data types uh, using this component based uh, system uh, are uh, lab values, um, uh, I, I forgetting right now, but we're working on genomics right now, so you can do genomic uh, variants, SNPs, uh, genes. Um, it, it really depends on how you've annotated your data within the um, tables. Uh, and if you create a new type of data that you're storing in the table that's not there, you can actually define it within the XML as a specific data type and then you can create a module within the new UI in a very uh, documented way. We have documentation on it that gives you the ability to uh, actually edit uh, or, or do a query specific for just that data type that you've created, uh, if that answers your question. Thanks. All right, so I do wanna make sure we get into our coffee break and come back at 1045, but let's give a, uh, a round of applause to Michelle and Michael and Carmen. Thanks very much.